What I, would, what I would like to do is, in, in about 45 minutes, uh, put a whole lot of ideas on the table and um, go through them briefly uh, as sort of an introduction thing. And, and the three uh, areas I've picked out, the f first one is called uh, urban regions, pattern, and ecology. So that's taking this, the broad view. The second one I call green spaces and connectivity. And that was uh, because I think Andrew wanted me to talk something about uh, green infrastructure. Uh, and so, but I'm going to focus a little bit more on the connectivity aspects of that. But I will go into the city. And then the third one has to do with road ecology and the netway system. And it's in the context of we talk about uh, greenhouse gases and global climate change. We talk about urbanization at scales of 25 years, 50 years. And too seldom do we talk about, well, what could we do for transportation in, tw in 25 years, for example? And so I'd like to put that on the table for you. Now let's see if we're going to work this. No. Oh, there we go. Uh, so these are some statistics, and, and these are uh, maybe three or four years old, but they, the basic pattern is still there. Uh, the world is growing in population, it's spreading out, cities are the main recipients of that, the, the rural population will stay constant, all the, new, the next two billion people will be urban, by and large, according to the United Nations Population Division. And at the bottom is sort of the summary there. It's really easy to see the urban tsunami spreading quickly and, and powerfully across the land and, and coalescing in places there. And uh, right just northeast of here is a very nice example of that in the La Valles, where there are hundreds of towns and cities, uh, towns and small cities, and, and they're all, most all of them are growing and they're threatening to coalesce into one mega urbanized area. And, and we see this in many parts of the world uh, there. So uh, that's the framework, uh, a lot of people, a lot of a place, and, and here's uh, one. Uh, future there, and I suppose you can't see it, uh, but it's all right. Uh, it just it simply says uh, indicates that there's a big uh, city there with a lot of pollution, a lot of cars there, and that, that's one future. And most people don't want that future, so we got to see what can we do instead of that. And I wanted to start with this. This this is a success story. Uh, and two two reasons I put this up there at the beginning. First of all, think big, and you can act on large, uh, large things. There, there's a, I have another slide, I don't have it here, of, of large projects which we have accomplished successfully as society. So you can think big, you can get uh, lead out of gasoline in many parts of the world, you can get DDT out of pesticides and mother's milk, you can uh, uh, establish national forest systems and, and things at a broad scale. And this is a success story here, because and you can't see that graph down at the bottom, but what it basically says, the total amount of protected area on the world, you know, globally, the land surface. And 25 years ago, it was about three, three or four percent. And in 25 years, it's, this graph says 15%, some people calculate 11%, but nevertheless, it's a huge increase in protected area worldwide in, tw in one generation, in 25 years. That's, a, that's an amazing success story. Now, there's lots more to be done, as, as this report points out, but uh, I, I just wanted to emphasize that we do have success stories. We have terrible disaster stories, too, but you can have success at, at the broad scale. Um, do I, maybe I'll point this this way, yeah. Um, this is a paper that we did uh, a few years ago, uh, and, and I'm not going to explain those graphs there. I just put it up to show you the world. Um, and what we did was, uh, we this has to do with biodiversity, and, and we calculated the um, distance between cities and protected areas in each region of the world. Distance between cities and protected areas from 2000 and, um, um, let me think now, 1995 to 2010. And then we projected the distance between cities and protected areas from in 2030 there. So um, the story, and so that you can read the paper if you're interested, but I just want to summarize what it said, what the paper sort of says. If you take an example of East Africa, the, the distance between uh, cities and protected areas in 2010 is 103 kilometers. 
average distance. And in 2030, it will be 53 kilometers. The distance will have. In East Asia, the distance in 2010 is 42 kilometers. And in 2030, it will be 22 kilometers. It'll be half again. Now, it doesn't change much in Western Europe, so those of you from here, it uh, doesn't change much in the States, actually, either. But So it's not a question of cities moving closer or protected areas moving. It's that towns are becoming cities, and they're coming up. And in another paper I haven't put in here, we've looked at the, di the Im environmental impacts of cities on protected areas and how which and how far those impacts go. So I wanted to uh, put that on the table, and, and here is an um, example of a Wolong Nature Reserve in China where it uh, adds another dimension to this story, and that is that when uh, the World Wildlife Fund and many other international agencies and the Chinese government finally uh, put boundaries, clear boundaries about 10 years ago, I think it was, around the Wolong Nature Reserve, including making them larger, um, that actually became the catalyst for environmental degradation out, right outside the, the Wolong, and, but also inside. In other words, if you look at the uh, Landsat images or you look at the data, uh, you'll see, whoa, at the time where the boundary was established is when environmental degradation outside and inside. And, and so there's the panda up there, and here's a man who's got his, uh, has been harvesting wood out of the Wolong Nature in the Reserve. And the reason, of course, is that, that that catalyzed road development, hotels, tourists, the communities of people that, that build the, the roads and, the build, and maintain the hotels and so on. And so it's a case of loving nature to death. So, it's, so basically, the previous slides, the two previous slides say you can work big, uh, you can have success stories. And the next one is suggesting uh, nature reserves and, and cities are getting closer. And this says, well, we're loving nature to death. We're overusing it. And you all know examples from your countries and, and my country where that happens. Um, now, the, the urban region, this is where I live, the Boston region, uh, Atlantic Ocean on the right, and basically, as that, that graph earlier, those data earlier say, that you know, we are homo sapiens urbanus, as of about four years ago, three years ago there. And more than half of us live in cities. And so, but the interesting thing is we don't live so much in cities. We live in urban regions now. And of course, then that's where we're going in this, in the, I'm going anyway. Uh, and so it's our place, we get some of our nourishment, it's our annual home range, not our daily home range. We get to know the urban region by living there over a few years, and that, the, it's our future, and that leads to a sense of place, familiarity and affinity. We care about it. And that's the, the sense of place that comes from those two things there. And so the, our sense of place is becoming the urban region. Recall, in a, in, this is the agricultural park uh, on the edge of Barcelona here. And I put this up there it, it, for two reasons. First of all, in the British terminology of market gardening. This is market gardening, it's wonderful. Uh, right next to the city, so you get the, the uh, uh, you go out here at five in the morning, you could do that tomorrow morning, you go out here at five in the morning, this is what is in my uh, yeah, uh, and there would be, just, there'd be a hundred little trucks filling up with strawberries and artichokes and, and all kinds of things, uh, cherries, and then those trucks go into the city, the Warren, the little narrow city, so when we wake up in the morning, every market and every restaurant has fresh vegetables and fresh fruits. It's wonderful, right next to the city. It cuts out the transportation costs. Every city should have two, I would say, but at least one large market garden. Las Huertas in, in uh, Valencia is a classic example, those of you who know Valencia. Um, now, the second reason I put up there is that proximity is economic value. And that's a really nice example of that. And here's another example if this thing will work. Here is, uh, well, here, the, the Romans had to bring water and they had a technology and so you couldn't bring water too far. Again, protecting your water supply is economic value. And if you're thinking of biodiversity, uh, the um, scientific director of the Nature Conservancy, Peter Kariva, uh, has, is very interested in ecosystem services. Uh, and um, one of the, his conclusions, although he's only told me he hasn't published as far as I know, one of his conclusions is that if you correlate a whole lot of ecosystem values with a whole lot of, I'm sorry, 
you correlate a whole lot of biodiversity with a whole lot of ecosystem values. Very few of them correlate, but one that does very strongly is protecting your water supply for the, for the city. You get a lot of biodiversity protection by protecting the water supply in cities. A proxima? I'm sorry, no. Yes, what? Okay. Um, this is just to say we're, we're interested. When I worked here with the folk in Barcelona, on the region around Barcelona, before, I'm an ecologist, and ecologists don't think that cities are really of much interest, <laughs> traditionally. Um, and my work here convinced me that's really important and really interesting. And so this was the next uh, uh, step in that, as to study for, uh, 38 urban regions on all continents, from large to small, in Asia and Latin America, Africa, and so forth, and uh, look for patterns. And I'm not going to give you the patterns, uh, Proxima. Um, these are the cities that I chose, and I didn't study the city, I studied the urban regions, a radius of 80 to 100 kilometers, a radius of 80 to 100 kilometers. Um, and I chose large to small cities uh, in Latin America from Iquitos, Peru to Me Mexico, and uh, you know, from uh, Abeche, Chad to uh, Cairo. And, and so I was interested, and I analyzed the spatial patterns related to natural systems and human uses of natural systems. That was the target, spatial patterns and natural systems and human uses of them. And much to my interest, um, about, eight, about 100, more than 100 analyses, um, about 85% or more did not correlate with city size. And, that's, and they also did not correlate with ge geographic region, which is a surrogate for culture or land use uh, type. And, um, but, but there's some inherent characteristics that come out of a, a city starting at a node and spreading out uh, uh, concentrically. Now, they don't set, spread out concentrically. They spread out, most cities spread out sort of bulges. They bulge here, the history of London, for example, bulge here and bulge here. And in fact, a bulge model would be a good, good one. I'll come, come back to that later, maybe. Um, but um, instead, it's the inherent geometry that comes from concentric and radial things that, that, has to, that seems to be really important at the regional scale. 